In this video, we'll take a look at proteins. What is the function of proteins? Proteins have many functions. They can be structural, that is, they can be used to build things like the skin. They can be used in transport to help bring molecules across cell membranes. They're used in signaling, some of them are hormones. They're used in movement and make up the fibers of our muscles. They can be used to defend our body against foreign invaders. Uh, they are antibodies. And they also can be used to control chemical reactions because they are enzymes. Many different functions of proteins. The structure of proteins is what enables them to have so many various different jobs. Shape is really important. It's completely related to their function. Each protein has its own unique shape and that's made possible by all the variations of the subunits that make up protein. Proteins are made of amino acids but there are many amino acids and so the combinations are pretty astronomical. Here's the structure of an amino acid. It's basically made up of two functional groups and an R group or a variable part. The first functional group is the amino group and this one's really obvious because it's got nitrogen in it and it's actually a nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens and it goes at one end of the amino acid. The other functional group is the carboxyl group which makes this a carboxylic acid and that's usually found at the other end. The R group stands for the variable part of the molecule and while all amino acids have an amino group and a carboxyl group, it's the variable part that makes the distinction between the various different amino acids. So here's another image of an amino acid. In this case, can you spot the amino group and can you spot the carboxyl group? Well, the amino group is on this side in this image and the carboxyl group is over here. The R again is shown as the variable part. Here are the amino acids that you would find in our body. You can see that each one of them has got the carboxyl group and the amino group and it's the other part that is the R group or the variable part. So in each one of these you should be able to spot the amino group and the carboxyl group and the R group. These are classified into four different groups. And for our needs we'll think of amino acids as either being hydrophobic, hydrophilic or possibly a combination of both depending upon their functional groups. How does a protein form? maybe you're already thinking about how they form because you know how carbohydrates form and you know how lipids form. Basically a protein forms when many amino acids are bonded together by condensation synthesis. Peptide bonds form between the amino acids. If we take a look at these three amino acids you'll probably notice the three important parts. You see that uh, they all have an amino group and a carboxyl group. There's the amino group, there's the carboxyl group. Amino group, carboxyl group. So we have three amino acids here. And from the graphic you've probably already guessed how this is going to work. You take a hydroxyl group off of one and a hydrogen off of the other and you'll get water. So what we see here is the formation of two peptide bonds because we've now linked three amino acids to each other. And we've also formed two molecules of water. Can you locate the peptide bond in this dipeptide? A dipeptide forms when one molecule of water is removed from two amino acids. You should have spotted it as being here because what's missing is the original hydrogen from the amino acid over here and the other thing that's missing is the OH group from the end of this amino acid. Conformation. Conformation is the three-dimensional shape of a protein. It's unique to each protein and is determined by the amino acid sequence and the interaction between functional R, R groups. There is a tremendous number of variations possible and the structure that's produced determines the function of the protein. Let's take a look at how the sequence of amino acids is actually going to determine the shape of the protein. There are four levels of protein organization. The first is called the primary structure and it's simply the unique sequence of amino acids 
depending upon which protein is to be built. And this sequence of amino acids is coded for by DNA. This is really all that DNA codes for, is the various proteins that are going to be used in living things. The sequence of amino acids is the result of peptide bonding between the amino acids. If the wrong sequence of amino acids is put together, you can end up with some very serious conditions because you'll have non-functional proteins. For example, a very slight change in the sequence of amino acids can result in sickle cell anemia where the hemoglobin, which is a protein and is located on the surface of red blood cells, may be slightly irregular. And as a result, when it comes in contact with carbon dioxide, it actually causes the red blood cells to change shape and begin to block the flow of blood, which can be very painful and detrimental. Sickle cell anemia is a metabolic disorder because it's an inborn disorder and it's caused by a faulty sequence of DNA, which results in the wrong sequence of amino acids, which results in hemoglobin that's abnormal. Secondary structure of proteins results from the repeated coiling or folding patterns of the amino acid chain. And this is because the functional groups actually interact with each other through hydrogen bonding. So you can probably guess that because this is involving hydrogen bonding, secondary structure of proteins is actually pretty easy to change. There are two types of secondary structure and they're both shown here. The alpha helix and the pleated beta sheet. The third level of protein structure is tertiary structure and this is further folding and contorting caused by hydrophobic interactions. Remember some of these amino acids are hydrophobic and some parts of some amino acids are hydrophobic. There'd be more hydrogen bonding between functional groups and ionic bonding. These are all relatively weak bonds you can also get some stronger bonds being made between cysteine molecules. Cysteine is another amino acid and it happens to contain sulfur. And when you get two cysteine molecules near one another, you get disulfide bonding. And disulfide bonding is a stronger form of bonding. The fourth level of protein structure is quaternary structure. And it results in the overall structure of the protein. What occurs here is that two or more of these polypeptide chains form an aggregate, or they bunch up. An example of this is hemoglobin, which is actually made up of two polypeptide chains. Proteins are very vulnerable. Their secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures can be disrupted by a number of things. And when this happens, we call it denaturation. It occurs when the normal conformation or shape is lost or changes. And this results from heat, pH changes, uh, salt concentration changes, or the presence of heavy metals like mercury or lead. Sometimes it's reversible and sometimes it's not. Since protein function is so closely related to structure, denaturation is a serious condition when it occurs to proteins inside of living things. Is the denaturation of eggs reversible or irreversible? See if you can answer these questions.